I'm going to talk with you today about React performance and a technique known as windowing. And we'll be talking uh, a lot in terms of React Virtualize, which is a library that I've written. But I'm also going to throw in some general performance tips and uh, other things that I've found um, useful. Uh, so I just wanted to get a sense for the audience first. Let me make this text pretty big. And you guys tell me if you can't read, and I'll make it bigger. So my name is Brian, as I mentioned. Uh, this is my GitHub and my Twitter, if you're interested. And this will be at the end of the slide as well. And these are all, the slides are also all online at, at GitHub. If you see anything you're interested in, you don't have to write it down. It's all on GitHub. So I work at Facebook. I'm on the React core team. And as I mentioned, I have a GitHub profile that I uh, am pretty excited about. Hope you guys will check it out. I have a lot of open source stuff there that I think is neat. And I particularly like working with things that relate to performance, search, or application architecture. So all of my open source stuff is sort of related to at least one of those things. And we are here today to talk about performance. Um, performance is a huge topic, so we're going to focus on things that slow React applications down. And I will mention some ways that you can speed them back up. And then I'll also share some lessons that I've learned over the past uh, couple of years working with open source components uh, in the React ecosystem. So performance is super important. And I'll get this slide out of the way, because I know you probably all know this. But we have fast computers and fast phones as engineers, typically. People that use our software have older, slower hardware. And this uh, impacts your applications in a variety of ways. One of them is slow times for your application to load up. And if it takes longer for your application to load, users are going to leave it. Um, similarly, if you have performance problems, they often manifest in uh, scrolling, which is a pretty crucial part of the user experience on mobile devices. And also, it impacts battery life. Um, so these are all reasons why we should care about performance. But what actually causes these problems? So specifically within a React application, there are sort of two high-level areas that can cause slowness. One of them is the browser itself. So if we're creating a lot of DOM elements or doing a lot of DOM mutations, this can cause slowness. Um, also, if we're triggering a lot of repaints or reflows in the browser, especially during performance-sensitive um, parts of our application, like scrolling, this can cause slowness. And garbage collection, uh, which is maybe not super intuitive, but I have a slide that'll demonstrate what I mean by this. But basically, if we create a lot of objects and then we throw them away, the browser has to clean them up at some point. When the browser does that is not up to us, and it may choose to do it at a time that's inconvenient for our application. So you can notice some performance impact from that as well. And then another uh, area of slowness is, of course, uh, React components themselves. So unnecessary renders, by which I mean any render that results in the same exact DOM uh, is unnecessary. And also, uh, sort of a little clown town bullet point here, but using the development version of React, we uh, see very big uh, production sites from companies that like, we would all know the names of that are running on the development build of React pretty commonly. Um, so first, before we dive into windowing, we'll talk about a couple of general tips for the React ecosystem. And as I mentioned, the first one is use the production build. And the reason is that the production build is faster and it's tinier. So our development build does a lot of checking for things that we think maybe you're doing accidentally or things that we know will be um, bad for performance. And then we give you nice user-friendly error messages about them. We strip those out in production so it's smaller and it runs faster. And I won't talk any more about it, but I will encourage you to check out the React installation page, we have instructions there for how to make sure you're using the production build with uh, Webpack, Rollup, uh, Create React App, UMD builds, um, pretty much everything you might want to use. OK, so I mentioned earlier that unnecessary renders are also a source of slowness. Um, <laughs> so what I mean by this is, let's say we have this DOM tree. And we have a, a set state operation at the top level. By default, React is going to re-render that node and everything below it in the tree. And this is really important because if we have a big application and something sets state at the top level, let's say Redux or something that changes a set state at the top level, we don't want our entire application to render. It's going to be really slow. So the solution for this is to use should component update. This is a method that React um, provides you that lets you basically say, uh, my component doesn't need to re-render because it's not going to change any of the DOM if it does. And if you use this method, React will skip all of the descendants of any component that says it doesn't need to update. And we make it really easy to use. Basically, if you're using React 15.3 or newer, there's a component called Pure Component. And Pure Component just compares the, it does a shallow comparison of the current props and state to 
the incoming props in state, and if they're equal, then it skips render. And you use it just like this, um, basically the same way you would use component. And if you're using uh, React 15.2 or older, then there's a utility method called shallow compare that works the same, except you return it from within your should component update. But they both just do a shallow comparison for you. And this can, in some applications, have a very big impact on performance. Another thing that's maybe a little less obvious is that you should choose your properties carefully. So let's say we're building this user badge that displays someone's name and email. We could have properties that is uh, our user's collection and an index, but this would not be great for performance because if our user's array changed, then all of our badges would re-render. So we could also have a property that's our user object, which would be a little better um, because now we're only gonna re-render a specific badge if it changes. But in this uh, admittedly kind of goofy example, we could do better still by just having the name and email. And the reason for this is that if unrelated things change, our component doesn't need to re-render. And with a component this simple, it doesn't matter that much, but as your application is filled with a lot of components like this, it can add up. And this also simplifies testing because you don't have to mock and set up as much of the surrounding application state to, uh, to do simple snapshot tests and such. And another thing that I recommend considering is using immutable data. So immutable data, there's a couple of libraries. Uh, Immutable.js is a big one. That's what linked right here in the slides. But basically with immutable data, anytime you change an attribute of an object, the immutable library will give you a new instance. And this is great because it lets you do a really fast comparison to see if anything has changed. You don't have to do a deep traversal, which can be slow. You just do a, an instance equality check. So mutation creates a new instance. Um, you might think, oh, but this is probably slower. And it is a little slower than a vanilla um, JavaScript object, but typically this isn't a source of bottlenecks in a larger application. And what you get from doing this um, is faster change detection, which can actually be significantly faster. So if you're doing a lot of should component update checks and you're able to just do a triple equals check for comparison, then it's gonna be much faster than if you have to iterate through and compare keys. Okay, and the last thing I wanna mention before we start diving into windowing specifically is not performance related, but it's a pattern that I found to be really helpful as a library developer, so I wanna share it with you guys, and that is render callbacks. <clears throat> so typically a React element, uh, its children will be other React elements. But you can also pass functions as children, and functions can return React elements. And you might wonder, why do you wanna do this? So Let's just make up a hypothetical to walk through that I think will hopefully show why this pa pattern is useful. Let's say we have an app that's, app that's localized. Um, we don't want each component that requires localization to have to worry about loading the localization. We could use context for this. Actually, context and localization are paired well together, but for our example, we could also have sort of a higher order component that loads the locale for us, and it doesn't matter how it does this. It could be a session, it could be an API, um, local storage. The key thing here is that this component can pass the localization to our render callback, and then we can use it without caring about how it's loaded. So let's say that one developer writes a component that manages localization, and another developer writes a component that loads user data, again, from the session or somewhere. The cool thing about render components, or render callbacks, is that we can now compose these things. So for example, if we wanted to make a localized user badge, <clears throat> we could use our lo localization component and pass it our render callback, that returns our user component, that eventually returns a localized user greeting. And this is really cool because you can mix and match these in any way you want, and they can come from different libraries or different authors. They don't need to know anything about each other. They don't use context. So they're pretty easy to test and to maintain. And this is a pattern I use a lot in React Virtualize, and so I thought I'd mention it as something I'm a big fan of. And also, so if you see any syntax that uses this later, you'll understand what it is. Okay, so back to the DOM. I mentioned that one of the sources of slowness uh, can be creating too many DOM elements, garbage collection, et cetera. So the, the really high level solution to this is to uh, only create the elements that the user can see on the screen at a given time. This is known as windowing and it's the focus of the talk here. And an analog example to this, I have an image that should have loaded that didn't load there. Um, an analog example of this is uh, the Kindle. Um, I had book initially and I gave this talk to one of my friends and they said, no one thinks about books, say something newer like the Kindle and so. Um, but the idea basically is the Kindle has an entire book's worth of text, you're only reading a page at one time so there's no reason for the Kindle to use its processor or its battery life to render the whole book and instead it just renders a single page and from your perspective, that's just as good. So video games do this and there it's called occlusion culling. <clears throat> 
But the idea is that if you have a camera that has a certain perspective in the game, the game engine has to determine what objects are in the direction that the camera's looking, and then rule out any that might be behind a wall or other objects and render what's left. And again, I have a picture here that's not loading, and I'm guessing that's because of the internet. Sorry about that. Um, the same concept exists for web and for mobile apps, and here it's called windowing. So the idea is if you have a small list that's scrollable and a large number of items, then you decide what the user can see and you render those. So I made a little animated SVG that shows maybe a little more how this works. So let's say we have a small DOM element, let's say a list, and some number of, element, of items that we want to render in the list. The way that windowing libraries typically work, including the one that I've written, is that we'll create a really large scrollable div inside of the smaller div, and we will absolutely position the visible items based on where a user has scrolled to. And then as a user scrolls around, the windowing library will shift the visible items. So from a user's perspective, this should be totally transparent. They shouldn't realize it's happening, but from a performance perspective, this saves us a lot of unnecessary operations. Um, so this is cool, there's a list. We, we understand how this works for a list, but there's a lot of things that you can do with windowing beyond this. So tables, lists, spreadsheets, all of these things can be windowed. Drop-down menus, um, oh, by the way, I have some links to libraries in, in, the, uh, in the slides here um, that you might wanna check out, open source things, that do what I'm talking about. Um, and again, I'll have a link to the whole slide deck at the end. But um, yeah, drop-down menus is another thing. Calendars and date pickers, um, trees, and a ton of other things, uh, including larger applications like news feeds like Facebook or Twitter or chat applications like Slack or Messenger. The key question to ask yourself is basically, will this data grow over time? And if it will, then there's a really good chance you should consider trying to window it. That way your application won't slow down um, as users use it more and more. So we have a demo here. Um, I'm gonna click a button and I'm gonna tell you when I click it and then we're gonna watch, so I'm gonna click it now. And I have uh, 15,000 items in an array, and I am generating a list of those items, not using windowing. This is just a simple array map. And you can see that it took about four seconds. Um, this is really bad. We don't want to do this in our application. Uh, this isn't loading anything from the server. It's not doing anything additional. It's just iterating over a local array. And another thing to consider is, now that we have these 15,000 items, I don't know if you can tell, but it's kind of slow to scroll, too. Um, so here's a thing I noticed right before the presentation, and that is that I do not recover from this slide well. Um, and I'll explain why, but for the moment, I'm just gonna kill it. Um, the reason uh, for this, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is garbage collection can also be expensive when you throw away a lot of things. And for some reason, this version of my slide deck it doesn't recover. <laughs> so keep that in mind. It's not just the cost you pay up front, it's a cost you pay while users are scrolling, and it's a cost you pay when you get rid of things. The browser has to get rid of them. Um, and it's probably not gonna be a convenient timed thing for your application. So now we're gonna render the same 15,000 item list, but we're gonna use uh, React Virtualize, and here you can see it took 0.03 seconds, and um, we have uh, a list that looks um, the same. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna open, <laughs> man, when I zoom in, things get kinda crazy. I'm gonna open the timeline panel, which is here somewhere, and I'm going to record and I'm going to scroll. And hopefully, we'll see that the frame rate, see I bounced the page, we'll see that the frame rate is right around 50, uh, 60 frames per second, which is sort of what we're all shooting for. Um, sorry about this. Okay. Oh, this is kind of embarrassing. Sorry about this, let me bump through to get back to where I was. Do, do, do. Now the pictures are loading at least. Um, yeah, okay, so we've seen that it makes a good performance um, gain, but what about how complex it is to use? So here's the first uh, list that I showed you. The way it basically works is we have um, an array that we're mapping, and then a function that renders each item in the array. Um, looking at the same list that we rendered with a windowing library, it's no more code. The way it works is you typically pass the number of items in the array and the function to render each item in the array. And you'll notice that the function takes an index and a style. And the index is what tells you which item to display, 
and the style tell, uh, tells React where to position the item within the larger scrollable list. So code-wise, we have almost the same number of lines to generate a windowed library, or a windowed list. So this uh, sort of segues into the focus of the remainder of the, tech, the talk, which is React Virtualize. This is the library that I've written, and we're gonna sort of take a dive into it, look at what it does, and uh, some uses of it. So there's a couple of components in React Virtualize that you can use in your applications out of the box. The first one is List. I think this was the very first one I wrote. And List basically just manages uh, windowing in a vertical direction. There's also Table, which does columned windowing vertically. Um, table has a fixed header and a windowed uh, scrollable body, but otherwise it works pretty similar to HTML table. And then there's Grid. Grid is one that I'm really excited about. Grid windows both horizontally and vertically. So you can build things like spreadsheets or um, large charting applications and only window the small horizontal and vertical slice of your information, which is a huge uh, performance saver. And then there's a funky one called Collection, which I have a demo of at the end of the presentation, but Collection is the one that you would use for less common layouts. So for instance, the masonry layout like Pinterest uses or a Gantt chart or something where the data isn't linear and maybe not even its position in the larger array isn't even corresponding to where it's located on the screen. Collection will help you with that. And now let's look a little deeper. So this next section, um, I'm gonna be talking through sort of some, uh, a mixture of challenges that I've learned while working on windowing stuff and also some things that might help you if you're thinking, well, can I actually use windowing in my app? I have to do this thing and this thing is kind of complicated. Will I still be able to do it? The first one is content that's variable sized. So variable sized content is tricky. Um, in some of the examples, I think all of the examples I've shown so far, the rows have all been the same size. This is a pretty easy calculation when you're doing windowing, but what if the rows have different heights? So it's tricky for a few reasons. One of them is that if you'll think back to that slide where I had the large scrollable div, how do I know how big to make that large scrollable div if I don't know the size of items in the list? I could measure everything up front, but then I kill our initial performance and we're back to the four second list that I had to begin with, so it's totally pointless to window at that point. There's two solutions to this. The first one is if you can infer the size from your data. So for example, in a dropdown list, maybe we have headers and items, and maybe those have different sizes, and we know the size based on the type. Then that's simple. The way that React Virtualize solves this is that you pass a function instead of a number for your row height, and it says, based on an index, what the height is. It's a pretty quick calculation. But what if your content needs to actually be measured by the browser with real fonts and padding and styles and such, like a chat application? That's a fake conversation I had with myself for this. For this. <laughs> yeah. And the answer to this is that I uh, have a component called cell measure. And cell measure, uh, the way it works is you render your column or your row like you normally would, and you wrap it with the component called cell measure. And cell measure will wait uh, for your content to be rendered asynchronously and then measure it and put its value into a cache. And the cache can be configured with some constraints like default size, minimum size, and such. But this component will basically do a just-in-time measurement for you, and then React Virtualize can just consume measurements from it. Measuring is still expensive, though, especially if you're doing cell measure. Um, so uh, the way that I address this, and I think maybe this is a somewhat common technique in windowing libraries, is that I use an estimated size initially for row heights and widths. So this. Uh, that's another, I made a lot of SVGs for this presentation. I don't normally make them, I'm kind of proud of them. This is another SVG. But it shows basically that we have a list. We haven't rendered everything in our list. And so for the things we haven't rendered yet, we're just using an estimated size. And this is enough to give users the ability to sort of scroll up and down to the content. And then as we render things, we slightly adjust what our total size is by the delta in the actual measured size versus the estimated size. And the result of this is that we're able to defer measuring almost everything until individually rendered, so we don't pay a big cost up front. And from a user's perspective, the adjustments are so small that a user doesn't actually notice that the, the track thumb is, is changing size by a pixel or so over time. So we don't want to measure everything up front. We also don't want to re-measure. So can we cache things? And the answer is that we definitely cache measurements. Um, but what about the cells themselves? What about the columns and the rows? Once they've been rendered, do we need to re-render them? This is kind of sad. I have a little all the things guy that's supposed to show up here. 
he doesn't show up. So yeah, we can cache a lot of things, but it's tricky. So um, lists on mobile and web are typically stateful. So there's hover effects, there's text inputs, focus, things like that. Um, and caching becomes really complex if we have to worry about all the possible conditions where we might have a cell invalidated. So what I do um, in React Virtualize uh, is cache only while scrolling. So when a user is scrolling through a list, it's usually pretty fast, and it's pretty unlikely that a row is gonna change during the small time frame when someone's scrolling. And so I cache what you've rendered while we're scrolling, and then I clear the cache as soon as scrolling stopped. And I think I have a slide that goes into this a little bit more later, um, some more techniques about optimizations during scrolling, but I'll just mention that for now. Um, this is a lesson learned. I don't know if uh, this is maybe just interesting to me, but I mentioned that uh, windowing is really good for performance, but what about the end user? Uh, so the application will load a lot faster for them, which is really good for them, but will they notice that something funny is happening with windowing? And the answer is that they, oh man. Okay, so there's a picture here that shows an interesting challenge that windowing libraries face, and that is, here we go, nice. Um, you can see uh, empty space at the bottom if you do a fling scroll. And this is uh, unique to windowing. <laughs> there you go. Um, and the reason is that JavaScript manages, or the browser rather, manages scroll events in a separate thread from the UI thread. And then it periodically notifies JavaScript, hey, there's a new scroll position here, and it does this by a scroll event. There can be a lot of things going on at the time. The browser can be doing layouts and paints, maybe something else running on the user's computer that's not even your JavaScript. But if JavaScript isn't fast enough and we exceed our 16 millisecond frame budget, then we won't keep up with the browser. And the result is a lower frame rate, but it's also that JavaScript can fall behind. And if we're absolutely positioning items in our list, the list scroll can get ahead of where we're putting items. So this, this sucks, we don't want this. So the solution for this um, is that we render a little more content predictively ahead or behind of the list based on where we think the user's gonna scroll next. And Here's a practical example of this. I'm gonna pull up my elements view here again and show you guys that we have, um, this is the visible items in our list, and then we render two extra ones where we think the user's gonna scroll next, which is down. And this is enough that I can quickly scroll and there's no empty space. So this is a really minimal impact on performance, but it has a big impact on UX. There have been lots of little, um, little gotchas like that I've learned when actually working in this space that hopefully if you use this library, you won't actually notice in your application. Another one that is interesting and was really challenging and is still kind of challenging is browser limitations. So different browsers have limits to how big they'll allow DOM elements to be before they'll just not handle them well. And this is because browsers weren't really intended to handle hundreds of thousands or millions of, of rows, but with techniques like windowing, we can handle that data. But we run up against these limits. And in Chrome, uh, the limit's pretty high, but in Internet Explorer and unfortunately in Edge, the limit's really tiny. It's a million and a half pixels. And basically, the browser won't render any farther than that limit. And you can't scroll to it, either with your mouse or with JavaScript. And as you approach that limit, the layout gets kind of unpredictable. And I have a picture here, and it did load. That's great. This is Chrome. This is what happens when you scroll to 33 and a half million pixels. Scrolling just stops. And it probably stops right in the middle of content. So you can tell there's content there, but you can't get to it. And you can also see that my one pixel borders are actually two pixel borders every other item, and I have no idea why this is, but it's just the layout gets bad when you get close to the threshold. So now that we can show all this content from a performance perspective, this is not a good experience. So the technique that I chose to get around this is basically just to compress things. So let's say we have this list, and the browser's not big enough to show all the items in the list, the way that React Virtualize works is it acts as though the list items that aren't visible are actually smaller than they were. And the net effect of this is that a user can scroll all the way to the end of their content. Um, the only side effect is that scrolling happens a little faster than otherwise would happen. Um, but at least they don't get cut off in the middle. And this is another thing you sort of just get for free with a windowing library. Um, so a concern that you might have as an application developer is what if my individual items are really heavy? So like what if I'm rendering big canvases or SVGs or what if I'm showing images? You definitely don't want to have a nice windowed list that a user does a fling scroll through and sends off 500 HTTP requests to load images, especially when the user's not even gonna see any of them by the time they stop scrolling. So what my suggestion is there is to render uh, less while you're scrolling. Um, 
React Virtualize passes a parameter called is scrolling to your row render, and you can use that parameter to render a lighter weight view of your row if you know your row is heavy. So for example, let's say we have a list of people that look a lot like me, and we don't want to load a bunch of images as I scroll through this list. So instead, what we do is we use this parameter and we show a placeholder image. And then as soon as scrolling stops, we load the image. This can be a really big uh, win um, in both the performance of your application and the, the data usage of your users if they're mobile. So they'll thank you for this. Um, OK, and now I have a couple of uh, sort of examples from real world uses that shows you some of the more, I guess, advanced things you can build with a library like this. And the first one is drag and drop. So drag and drop is a pretty popular thing to, to use on mobile and web. But you can think, uh, if I'm using windowing, that kind of complicates drag and drop a lot. Fortunately, one of my friends wrote a library called React Sortable, Hawk, high order component, that wraps React Virtualize and adds drag and drop. So here we have a list, and you can see that I'm able to drag things within it, and this works well on mobile and web. And um, the code to implement this is uh, very straightforward. Basically, you import a list and row wrapper from React Sortable, and you wrap them around React Virtualize, and then you render your row and your list like you normally would. And the only additional thing you have to do is when it tells you that an item has been moved to a new index, you rearrange your array. And it even provides you with a utility method called array move that does this for you. Um, and again, all this code is going to be shared at, on GitHub with you, so you don't have to worry about if you're interested in any of it, writing it down. Um, there's also um, UX, maybe we want to resize our rows or columns. There's a, a library called React Draggable that works well for that. So here we have a list, and I can um, drag and drop resize items in my list. And if I scroll away and scroll back, they maintain their size. This is a, a similar really tiny amount of code. The only thing you do additional is you add a drag handle from React Draggable, and you listen for when it tells you that an item has been resized, and you adjust whatever your local um, data structure is that store sizes. And uh, sticky rows and columns are another really popular thing. So I mentioned that I window vertically and horizontally, and uh, that's a big performance win, but what if you want fixed columns or headers? Well, there's a component called multigrid that you can use for that. And I, I spent like 15 minutes and I wrote a Google spreadsheet uh, lookalike um, that uses um, multigrid. And the code for it's really simple. You, you treat it like a regular grid, all the same properties. Um, the only difference is you tell it how many columns and rows it should fix in the top and left. I'm working on right-to-left support, by the way. It's top and left only right now, but we'll get there. Um, and one more thing I wanted to point out specifically about this example is that you don't have to just render divs. You can, uh, or sorry, you, don't, you can't window more than just divs. So in this example, I'm windowing a bunch of inputs. But any DOM element, so image, canvas, SVG, input, anything that's a DOM element that can be displayed can be windowed. The key is that you just have to give it a key for React so it can reconcile it uh, performantly. And then you give it a style which has the position information so that it appears at the right space in the mostly empty list. And otherwise, yeah, you can window it. And I mentioned collection. And I have a totally randomly generated demo, so it looks kind of funky. But this is what. Um, the collection component lets you use data where the position in the index totally doesn't match the position on the screen, and it still windows what's displayed so that it only displays the stuff that's in the viewport being scrolled. It's a little more complicated to use, but basically the way it works is that you give it a function that's responsible for telling it the position of the data, um, which has to be inferred from the data, unfortunately. But if you're building a Gantt chart or you're building some burn down chart, for instance, you can infer this information by maybe the date in your item. And then a renderer, which looks the same as a grid renderer. Yeah. And then I also have uh, one more thing to talk about, which is, uh, and then I'll have questions. But one more thing to talk about, which is common mistakes for people that use React Virtualize. And the, the biggest mistake is that the style is forgotten. So here's an example of a question I see on Stack Overflow a lot. Why doesn't this work? And the reason is that you forgot to include the style object. And the style object is what positions the rows. And I added, um, I added a dev warning in version 9, sort of taking a, borrowing a page from the React book. But if you forget this property, it now prints out a nice warning in the console that you forgot to position your element. And then uh, another thing to point out is that React virtualized components are subclasses of pure component, which means they only re-render if their properties change. But 
they don't have any access to your application data. You give it a very tiny amount of information, the number of rows, for instance, and a renderer for a row, and that's it. This means that if your data is sorted in your application, or if you have state in items, for instance, like mouse over state or other things that might change the size of the items, React Virtualize won't know about this. And the solution for that is that you just need to tell it that something has changed. And there's two ways you can do that. And this is also sort of just a general tip for how React components work. But um, if you have a component that's pure, so it does, doesn't re-render unless its properties change, but you have another piece of uh, information that you know is going to impact those properties, you can pass it through as an additional property. So in this case, if we have a sortable list, maybe we have a sort order key that tells us what our list is sorted by. We can pass that through to React Virtualize, and even though it doesn't use that key at all, this is enough that the shallow comparison utils in the React Pure uh, component will tell that something's changed and it'll re-render. And the other way that you can do this, if you have a class component and a ref, is you can just call force update on it. But this is a little more verbose, and it doesn't work with stateless functional components. So the recommended way is that you just pass through an additional prop. And that is uh, everything. I'm a little early, but uh, I know there's lunch coming up. So if you guys have questions, I'll take questions, or you can come up and talk to me. And I also won't be offended if you just go eat lunch. But thank you for your time. Thank you.